Hi, I'm Teresa from Phoenix Gate Crafts, and I want to talk about wool today. So basically what's happening is I'm going to be doing a series of videos, and each video is going to focus on a different type of fiber, a, a specific fiber. So like today is wool. I'm going to make another one that is acrylic. One's going to be alpaca. One's going to be cotton. I might do like um, bamboo or silk or cashmere in the future. I haven't decided on the entire list, but I figure wool is a good one to start with because it is a mainstay in the fiber community. So we have three kind of main fibers and a whole bunch of supplementary fibers. So wool, acrylic, and cotton are the three main fibers that are the easiest to find pretty much everywhere in the United States. Um, I personally live in um, Central California, so um, some fibers are just not found here. They're not easily accessed because they're kind of specialty, like a yak or a camel. Um, especially since, you know, I live in a warm climate, so a lot of those fibers designed for really cold climates just don't really appear here all that much for practical reasons. But wool definitely does, and it's kind of a mainstay in the knitting community in particular. Um, it's also a lot easier to talk about wool because it's the basis for how we perceive a lot of the other fibers. So let's talk wool. So in order to talk about wool, we have to talk about where wool comes from, a little bit about how it's prepared, and we have to talk about the structure of the fiber itself because a lot of what makes wool work the way it does is the structure of it. So wool comes from sheep and there are many different breeds of sheep that produce wool. The sheep that produce wool are not the same sheep who produce meat, just to give you a heads up on that. And because sheep have been bred for centuries to produce more and more wool, they're actually in a situation where if they aren't sheared, they are in danger of heat stroke and potentially um, heat exhaustion and death from heat. That's why uh, sheep are sheared, which is basically just shaving off the uh, wool coat in the spring which means that worldwide there are two shearing seasons. There's one shearing season when the Northern Hemisphere is having their spring, and there's another shearing season in the fall when the Southern Hemisphere is having their spring. So, you know, you can tell I live in the Northern Hemisphere. Because of this schedule for shearing, there is only so much wool that is produced annually. And by the way, uh, most of the time, sheep are not harmed in the shearing process. You know, they might get a cut, they might get some shaving burn, but it's nothing more serious than what a guy gets when he shaves his chin. Um, it's done through a series of poses with a professional shearer at most small farms. Um, I can't speak for bigger conglomerates or the safety of the sheep there, but most smaller sheep farms are actually very humane towards their sheep. So once it's sheared, it is processed. It is cleaned of any dirt, poop, or um, vegetable matter. It is uh, brushed so that all of the uh, fibers line up and then it is spun, so we actually get the yarn, and then it is dyed um, so that we get the beautiful colors, and then it is actually wound into skeins and sold as yarn. That's pretty much the very simplified process. Um, now, the structure of the fiber is unique. It is um, very wiry and very curly and each strand of hair, of wool, <laughs> yep, 
each fiber has a whole bunch of scales on it. And these scales are um, just kind of natural cuticle on the hair. But what they do is they help the hair to grab. So uh, I find that a very easy explanation is that wool is very much like this. It is stringy, it is very much like ribbon. And each hair, you'll wind up in a skein of yarn, uh, wool from several different sheep. And you can have it, as you brush it, you get them all going the same direction. Um, this one's not quite so curly. And then once it's spun together, you can kind of get it to kind of go along and it winds up kind of going in the same direction and it is twisted together. I'm not gonna do that because I have a demonstration that's kind of necessary for later. And you wind up with nice, neat curls with a nice, neat twist. So this is very important because most sheep structures, because of this curl, it means that wool yarn is stretchy and it has memory and it's going to spring back to its natural position. Um, I have a bit of wool here that I dyed myself. And you can see that when I, this is it at kind of a resting position and I can stretch it a bit. It gets thinner and it pulls and then it comes back to a at ease position. This natural stretch within the yarn strand itself is called stretch and memory because it remembers where it used to be. And it's an important feature of the yarn itself because that stretch and memory is what gives wool its structure. If you look at this hat, you can see that it easily holds its shape even when it's not on my head, pardon my hair. Um, this is crocheted, which has a little bit more structure than a uh, knit, but I have a matching knit sweater that I have often worn on this channel and that also holds a structure. Um, the ribbing pulls in. If you have uh, cables, you'll definitely be able to see the cables and the stitch definition. See that? Um, you do get a little bit of halo sometimes depending on the breed and there is differences depending on the breed. So um, like there's Peruvian Highland wool, which tends to be a little bit more scratchy um, and a lot more solid. That's what this stuff is. Um, you can have uh, Merino wool, which is typically used in socks or in anything that you want um, to touch some delicate skin because it's very soft. Um, another popular uh, sock yarn is made out of BFL or Blue Face Luster. I've never used that one myself, but I am told it's absolutely divine to work with. So, but they all work in under the same conditions. They work the same way, even though they feel a little bit different and have a different level of stretch and memory. So I'm gonna put this back on my head now because I'm a bit cold. Don't work in a tank top in early spring, man. Anyway, so because of this natural structure, um, wool is really good for anything that you want to have structure. Socks are amazing because as you can see, the sock will hold its shape. Um, the ribbing will actually pull in despite having been worn several times. So it'll pull in, even after it's been worn, it'll pull in. So the next time you wear this sock, it'll still fit properly as if you hadn't worn it the previous day. Um, also, because of this natural curliness, there are pockets of air within the spin of the fiber. These pockets of air are actually what help insulate heat. So wool is considered to be a warm fiber, but it isn't because the fiber creates heat. It's because it keeps the heat on the same side 
of the fiber as the heat source. So if you are in a cold climate and you're wearing a sweater made out of wool, you are producing body heat and it's going to keep that body heat next to your skin so you'll feel warm. If you are in a hot climate, in the Middle East, burqas are very common, partially for religious reasons, but also because having wool burqas actually insulates the women. Their body temperature is approximately 98 degrees, but the sun is beating down on them at 120 degrees. So it's keeping that heat, that 120 degrees, off of them, which keeps them relatively cool. So very practical that way. Um, also, what wool does is it wicks away moisture. So basically it takes the moisture that is next to your skin, your sweat basically, and it pulls it away from your skin, which helps if you're too hot, that helps cool you off a little bit. And also if you're sweating because you're a little bit warm and say you've got very sweaty feet, if you take off your socks, um, because they've wicked away the moisture, your feet aren't wet anymore. So you're not going to get that splash of cold air against your feet, uh, evaporating that sweat and thereby making your feet suddenly very cold. So that just isn't going to happen with wool, which makes it very good for keeping you at a stable temperature. That's actually what it does for sheep. Uh, in the summer, sheep need about an inch or so of wool to help prevent sunburn and to help them uh, regulate their body temperatures, but only an inch. More than that, and it really doesn't help. But because of the structure and because of those um, scales that are on wool, there is something else that can happen, and that's felting. And this is the big downside, because when you add heat, water, and friction all at the same time, the yarn is very likely to felt. And what felting is, is basically something, usually a strong change in temperature between hot and cold water, causes the, um, fibers to release their hold where they already are. And then the agitation causes them to move and connect. And the next thing you know, they're a tangled mess with themselves. You notice how it went from being this long strand to a much smaller mess. That's basically what happens with felting. Um, you also notice that this is a little bit less elastic in certain areas. You really can't get it to move as well. It doesn't like to move in the same way. That's what felting does. It um, causes the fibers that were lined up to release and tangle and come in a different way. And when that happens, they don't pull apart as easily as they would have if they had been in this formation. They can't do that stretch and memory. So you wind up with a denser fabric and you wind up with a fabric that is shrunk and you wind up with a fabric that is less stretchy and you don't see any of your beautiful stitch definition. Now this isn't necessarily bad for a project. This is actually really good if you're making Easter baskets, for example. Um, you, there are people who like to do felted mittens because they have a better insulative property. Um, and in fact, if you are interested in an Easter basket, uh, Very Pink Knits has an interesting video on how to do that, that I am going to link in the description box. But um, that's not necessarily something you want in a hat where you want to be able to see the um, cables. That isn't necessarily what you want in a sweater where you have intricate color work. That isn't necessarily what you want to happen in socks where that elasticity is key to how they fit. So um, making sure that you are washing your woolen knits properly so that way you don't get felting when you don't want it. Basically hand washing and laying flat to dry is a key to the whole thing. At least that's what happens 
when you have natural wool. When you have superwash wool, you actually can wash it in the washing machine and you can dry it in the dryer. What the superwash process is, is it's a chemical process that strips all of the wool fibers of their scales. So it's no longer going to attach in the same way. Um, and as a result, it makes it a little bit slipperier and it makes it um, a little bit stretchier. Some people claim it doesn't have as much memory as traditional wool, but in my experience, it does. You just have to remember that when you wash it in the washing machine, as long as it says on the label that you can dry it in the dryer, you should dry it in the dryer because that activates the memory that shrinks it back down to, well, shrinks, it doesn't actually shrink, that pulls it back down to its size. Just be aware that the superwash method is not environmentally friendly, but also so are many of the dyeing processes because they use um, heavy metals in the dye powders. Hi, this is Teresa from the future. Quick thing that I forgot when I was talking about wool is that wool is notorious for being an allergen. Some people are highly allergic to wool, which means that they touch wool and they get hives on their skin. Um, their eyes get itchy, their throat may close up. It can be a very dangerous fiber to some people. Some people are like me, however, and we are just sensitive. So the natural slight scratchiness that exists in many different types of wool is something that bothers us, might make us itch a little bit. We feel the wool on us as something that's scratchy instead of soft. It doesn't really bother us. I just have to be careful that when I'm working with wool, I wash my hands before I touch my eyes, but I don't have an actual allergy to it. When you're knitting with, when you're knitting for babies, you want to be careful because they can either be sensitive or have a full on allergy. So if you are knitting with wool for babies, one, make sure that it is super wash because babies are disgusting and mom is going to want to throw whatever that item is in the washing machine to get it truly clean. And for another, make sure that it is super soft because if, because baby skin is very new, baby skin is going to be more sensitive to any slight scritchiness. And a baby can very easily have an allergic reaction to something as rough as wool can be. So you want to be very careful when you're making anything for a baby or anybody who has particularly sensitive skin. Just wanted to interrupt myself with that warning. Back to what I was talking about before. The thing is, you're not always going to find 100% wool. You do find 100% wool, but a lot of times you actually find wool in a blend with other yarns. So what qualities does wool bring to a blended yarn? Um, it brings that structure and it brings that stretch and memory. So if you're blending it with something that doesn't have stretch and memory, it might not be quite as elastic as 100% wool, but usually it's blended with something that gives it a little bit more strength because wool itself, although it has structure, it doesn't necessarily have strength and it can be worn through. In fact, wool is kind of known for pilling, especially superwash wool, because what happens with pilling is that the ends of the fibers aren't necessarily tucked into the spin of the wool. And when that happens, they are, um, as you wear, because pilling tends to happen like under the arms or 
other places where you tend to rub a lot and it's basically going to peel some of the threads out um, and ball them up. All you have to do is pick them off. That's perfectly fine. And um, after pretty much all the ends are out, you're not going to have very much pilling anymore. Um, but, you know, because of that, because of rubbing, because of the natural felting, um, you can actually wear out wool. It is not the strongest fiber ever. So it's usually put with a strengthener, something usually um, silk, nylon, or mohair. Um, you can also find it with something softer like cashmere or um, alpaca that'll make it feel a little bit softer because although yes, there are some soft wools, there are also some not so soft wools. So blends actually really help um, get the fiber qualities that you want through the blending. Um, so yeah, that's wool. I hope you found this helpful. And um, I figure one of my next upcoming videos, I'm going to be talking about either acrylic or alpaca. Feel like doing an A as the second video in this series. Anyway, I hope this helped. Happy crafting. Bye.